This week on Quadriga, the massacre in Norway, an attack on openness and tolerance. The car bomb exploded in the heart of a capital as relaxed and low-key as a 21st century city can be. Together with the shooting rampage at a camp on the island of Utøya, it left Norwegians deeply shaken and deeply determined to uphold the country's liberal values, even in the face of hatred and violence as brutal as that unleashed by Anders Bering Breivik in a massacre that sent shockwaves across Europe. Your host, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga, the international talk show on DWTV. How has the massacre changed Norway? And what does it mean for Europe as a whole? That's what we want to talk about today with three European journalists who've been following the events. Alan Positor is opinion page editor for the German newspaper Welt am Sonntag and author of several biographies. Peter Carstens is a political correspondent for the German daily Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and frequently covers security issues. Asbjorn Svastad is based in Berlin and reports for Norway's largest newspaper, the Dagbladet. Jens Fastad, how did you first hear about the massacre and what was your reaction? Yeah, I heard it from the newspaper uh, a couple of minutes after it had happened. And uh, of course I was shocked. But um, as uh, many uh, fellow countrymen, I, I also thought this must be some kind of terrorism uh, according to the Norwegian uh, NATO. Of, uh, um, that we are in, in Afghanistan and in Libya, and that it uh, was some kind of uh, revenge from Gaddafi was my first uh, reaction, I think. But then I, I uh, heard uh, that somebody attacked the island as well, and it became pretty obvious very fast what, what was happening, or that this is, this is not about uh, Muslim terrorism, thank God, uh, but this must be something else. This is what we call homegrown terrorism. Of course, the U.S. has had uh, significant experiences with this. What are you hearing now from friends and family in Norway? How are they coping? We are having <clears throat> new shocks every day. Uh, myself, yesterday evening, a colleague of my wife, who is a teacher in Oslo, called and told that one of her students are among the missing. The, uh, I think that every one of these 68 children is a big tra tragedy and we, we take it a little or very much more personally every one of us because we are so few and we most people know each other or you know somebody who knows somebody so it's it's um, it's changing all the time between grief shock uh, and anger uh, i guess we are in for some more anger now after the funerals are over and the, the big feelings uh, have been shown uh, the the daily life is coming back people are gonna get angry alan posner <coughs> it is homegrown it was perpetrated by one individual is it in that way do you think in your opinion a unique act perpetrated by a deranged criminal or is it a product of larger societal trends that are not confined even to Norway alone? Well, it's obviously a lone act by a deranged individual. Um, the question is, um, did he imagine himself to be the agent of a greater necessary movement? And that is obvious from his manifesto that that's what he felt, that he, that he felt that there was a large, as he called it, conservative cultural revolution taking place in, in Europe, that, that, a, that a, a civil war against Muslims was inevitable and that he was going to uh, sort of be the one to, it was what, what, what used to be called um, uh, the, the, the philosoph philosophy of action, propaganda of action, that he was going to take matters into his own hands. Uh, so he's not part of an organized group, but he is, uh, but he could, he, he found uh, the elements of his uh, nutty philosophy, if you will, uh, in the internet and in a broad anti-immigrant, anti-liberal movement, which is unfortunately uh, part of uh, Europe today. Peter Carstens, the Prime Minister of Norway, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, called after the attack for more democracy, more uh, freedom of opinion, freedom of speech, but less naivete. Was Norway, in some sense, prior to the attack, naive in the sense that police and security structures were inadequate? 
Um, wh whether the police structure uh, were efficient enough, this will have to be uh, seen in um, the uh, explorations that are going on. And um, it, it's a, uh, one field of uh, what follows of the uh, massacre is the police in Norway. Um, was it able to cope uh, within time uh, with that phenomenon? Um, you may ask even the German police what will happen if something like that would happen in a small village outside of the big cities. How fast would a German um, mobile command would be at the place of the scene? Um, the other consequences is, um, are not foreseeable at the moment. I think that uh, no, no society can be not so naive to anticipate, uh, anticipate such a crime. I mean, um, you have to be a very pessimistic society to anticipate such a crime, and, and this would not be very good for a society to anticipate all the time such crimes. For instance, if we uh, look at the uh, Islamic or jihadist phenomenon, if we would be um, as pessimistic as may be necessary, we would not sit in this room here, uh, just close to the Brandenburg Gate, but because maybe an attack could be launched every minute to uh, Berlin Central Station or the Berlin uh, Capital uh, District. So uh, naivete is, is a very good fundament of a, of a democratic and open society. You have to be a little bit naive to make life comfortable in an open society. That's nicely put. Uh, Björn Svarstad, Prime Minister Stoltenberg has said there will be an investigation after this initial period of mourning. There will be an investigation into the security services reaction. From what you know so far, were big mistakes made? I haven't seen them. The police has been criticized, uh, but that was uh, right after it happened for not being fast enough there. As far as I'm concerned, it took 40 minutes from the... Uh, I'm not talking about what happened on the island. It took 40 minutes from the alarm came until the police officers uh, were there. And uh, it was claimed they had troubles with their boats. They had trouble with their boats, but it didn't cost them any time because they were taken over in other boats and, and taken ashore. So uh, it's hard to imagine that you could have... Uh, armed troops, so to say, on this island. You, they didn't know what the situation was. They knew that somebody was uh, shooting wildly around. You cannot send um, unqualified people there to take care of the situation. You will have a new mess, you know. So I think, after all, in this situation, it, was, it, um, it worked, prob probably. But his investigation will show if that is right. And as we hear, security is now being beefed up uh, in Norway, yet many Norwegians are determined that there will not be a trade-off between openness and security. Norwegians say the attacks have only strengthened their resolve. Hundreds of thousands assembled to mourn the victims and support their prime minister in his call for courage and trust. With the strongest weapons in the world, freedom of opinion and democracy, we will steer Norway's course after the 22nd of July. There's a before, but also an after. And how Norway looks in the future is up to us. Alan Posner, how should things look in the future? Where do you see the need for greater vigilance? Oh dear, um, I, I'm not a police expert. How would I know where the need for greater village, uh, vigilance is? I go to work every day with the underground here in Berlin and um, every time someone gets on, and I have to say, you know, maybe it's a Mediterranean looking person to put it that way, and he has a big sports bag, you know, there's this slight tinge of anxiety. Um, what if this is the guy who wants to do the London bombing in Berlin? And I hate this. I, ha I hate looking at people and sort of racially profiling them. I hate being afraid, but I would hate it even more probably um, if, um, you know, if bags were controlled every time, uh, you know, at, at every entrance to the subway, it would, be, it would become a, a pretty bad place to live. Therefore... I agree totally. We need a certain amount of naivety and sort of cross your fingers. And it, you know, the the, the actual uh, uh, possibility the, the, of, of of getting blown up and killed is fairly low. Touch wood. Um, so we have to live with the fact that we can't control everything. We have to. Otherwise, we give ourselves up. 
Peter Carstens, your paper, the Frankfurt Allgemeine newspaper, has written extensively this week about the link between the Internet and the attacks. Have the new media, media escalated the risk of this kind of terrorism? Interesting question. <laughs> um, will have to be evaluated. I think um, the Internet is a platform for this kind of um, irrational guys. They find each other in the Internet. Um, in, in the whole uh, range of um, strange things happening in societies. I mean, it's, it's beginning with uh, sexual behavior and it's ending with terrorism. And you, you find everything which is absurd, strange, offending in the Internet, um, in, in the whole field of society. And um, it's much easier uh, for the nerd guys in societies to find each other so, um, and, and to strengthen each other in the Internet. And this may be um, may have played a role for uh, the personal story of Breivik that that he found people of the same mind. He was not alone with that. It, it makes things much easier. And um, uh, to compare that to jihadism, I mean, uh, the internet is a very important source for recruiting young jihadists. It, it's that effective that it is able to recruit as it happened in Frankfurt, um, people who ha have never been in touch with any kind of Bin Laden movement. They're just sitting in their um, child's room and are recruited virtually by the Internet. And this is a phenomenon that has to be explored much uh, closer. And I think the whole phenomenon of cyber war, and this is a part of cyber war, um, is terribly underestimated in Germany, in Europe, and maybe not in the United States, but they are there just looking at a small uh, piece of the cake. Björn Svastad, certainly Breivik seems to have found a lot of the sources of his inspiration on the Internet. He's written a manifesto that's a real pastiche of... He hasn't written it. It's um, copy-paste. <laughs> Well-known mess here. <laughs> you can get a doctorate with a copy and paste. <laughs> Apropos new media and their effect on... Uh, no, he has stolen, stolen lots of it, and, uh, and lots of it. Uh, he's telling the story of his life. That's also not correct. He's telling he was uh, protected by a group of uh, criminal immigrants in Oslo. Uh, being a young boy growing up, that was his way through the hard jungle there on the streets. It's a lie. He, he, was, he didn't know any of them. And it goes like this all the way. He, he has made a, an image of himself. This is a half-smart... Uh, loser, uh, <clears throat> with a mother loving him dearly and telling him every time he falls on his nose that it wasn't your fault. Come on, we'll try a new business and if it goes bankrupt this time as well, we try it again because you are a genius. It's, uh, it's a narcissist. It, this could have happened in, um, in uh, any other country uh, in Europe, I think. It's, it's not a Norwegian phenomenon. Uh, in, in his uh, manifesto, he has got one Norwegian guy uh, for whom he, he shows respect, nothing else. <laughs> it was on the World Wide Web that Breivik found and published his inspiration in a manifesto that exactly sets forth his objectives. Anders Bering Breivik saw the twin attacks as an act of war. He laid the groundwork methodically over the course of years. In a 1,500-page manifesto, he stoked fears of Muslim domination in Europe, citing Christian fundamentalists and right-wing populists to justify his hate and anger. An ugly document, but not entirely unfamiliar. Inflammatory words like these have helped fuel right-wing parties across Europe in recent years. Peter Carstens, would it be possible to shut down these kind of online communications between extremists between marginalized individuals of the type that you described? Very difficult. Uh, the, the providers sit everywhere, especially in Scandinavia, very open societies. You find many of the um, extreme right browsers in uh, Denmark and um, or in the United States, so extremist networks um, are not easy to interfere technically. And I think this is not the right answer on, um, on behavior like that or movements like that. You have to cope with them. You, you should tackle them with arguments. You, you couldn't tackle them with uh, technique. Um, 
you, you won't have the results that you would like to have by just shutting down the internet communication, which is nearly impossible, to my opinion. In other words, Alan Posner, it's a political uh, challenge and not a technological one. The European Green Party leader, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, said this week that much of what Breivik wrote could have been said by any right-wing politician. Do you think that's true? And if so, what are the implications of that? Well, I don't know what uh, Danny Kuhn Bendit means by a uh, right wing politician. I mean, he is someone, as a leader of uh, the student movement of 68, who should know that uh, it's very easy to go from being um, a radical Democrat to someone who goes beyond the pale as far as, and, 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 who, and who calls for violence and who, whose words lead to actions which may. Um, which, he, which he may not, which he certainly never in, envisaged. I mean, uh, uh, Danny Kuhn Bendit certainly never envisaged that from his words would spring uh, the Red Army faction and, 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 and neo communist terrorism in, in Europe in the 70s. But there is a connection. Now, I wouldn't make him responsible for that. So um, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's one of the points we have to be very careful. Um, I think self criticism by certain sections of um, uh, of Islamist, uh, Islam critical, immigrant critical politicians is in order. People try to reflect on what they say and especially how they say it and what forums they say it, definitely. But, you know, to, to clamp down, uh, to somehow make everyone who has a, uh, who has a maybe even rather obnoxious opinion on immigrants uh, simply shut them down, I don't think that will answer the problem at all because people will just emigrate even more into these even more obnoxious websites. Jens Vastad, what do you think? Have right-wing politicians and their rhetoric in Europe help to create a climate in which someone like Breivik could find inspiration and feel legitimized? I think we have to be careful uh, with whom we are pointing our fingers at now, because uh, first of all, we must make it clear that a right-wing populist is not the same thing as a, a right-wing extremist. And uh, lots of the politicians on the right side of the uh, legal political picture uh, today they are, uh, of course, it's legal what they are doing to to uh, debate immigration, to uh, debate how it works and, and what it costs to society. It's just uh, they, uh, they very often use the same uh, uh, terms as, uh, as Nazis and uh, it can be hard to, to see the dif difference. Uh, I think Breivik, uh, he has lots in common with, uh, with uh, uh, Nazis. He is not a Nazi himself, uh, uh, but uh, perhaps the modern uh, um, example of a Nazi. I would like to say one thing, though. I mean, uh, liberals have always said that you have to differentiate between jihadists, fundamental uh, uh, um, uh, members of the Islamic community or not necessarily Islamists and the general uh, uh, Muslim population. People like Riyad Wilders and, 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 the, and, the, and the Progressive Party in, 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 in Norway have refused to do that. They've more or less said, well, it's all the same and, 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 and the problem is Islam, not Jihad. And, um, and now this is coming back to haunt them, of course, because on the liberal people on the left are now, say, are now doing the same with them and saying, well, you know, we're not going to differentiate uh, between uh, sort of a right wing Gerd Wilders who's, uh, and, 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 a ma and a mass murderer. Gerd Wilders um, being, of course, the Dutch uh, politician. The Dutch who populist has politician. A huge so, following. Right. Um, we, we also have them in Denmark big time. It's, it's a, it's a yeah. totally other climate in Denmark than in Norway and Sweden. I mean, for they, 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 they ought to learn. To, to, to be careful what they say because they, you know they're getting a touch of their own medicine. You know, it's not it's not right, but I think it's understandable. And they are the last people who should should be complaining about this. They've been doing this for months, years. Peter Carstens, should European countries be keeping a closer eye on right wing parties and doing more to stop this kind of inflammatory rhetoric? Um, this is another discussion apart from the from the case of massacre in Norway I mean um, I, we should have said are first those discussions linked they are somehow linked but to put it first is that Breivik is a saddest mass murder 
and um, the, the political camouflage is maybe part of the whole scenery. But I, I think he, the, the, the most satisfying moment of his life seems to be the hour of mass killing on the island. It, it is reported that he laughed, that he was, he was happy at that moment. He didn't do a hard work for the movement. I mean, political ideologists do nasty things just for, for the sake of their movement. And th what I heard from this guy, he was happy, he was satisfied in killing teenies. And Under he, drugs, with the uniform that he had made himself. Yeah, so th this, this is a this story is of its own. This is taking us back to the question, deranged individual yeah. as opposed to societal trend. You should not close, uh, you should not link it too close to extremist movements in Europe. This, the other debate, which may start at the wrong moment, but may start, is um, did, we, did we forget to look at these kind of guys all over Europe during the last... 10 years since 9-11. I mean, the whole German security architecture was changed and now looks towards uh, some 150 jihadists that live somewhere in Germany and tries to keep them under control. And um, they, they, maybe they didn't forget it, but they didn't have the, the resources to look at organized crime and they did not have many resources to have a closer look at um, extremist right-wing uh, persons in Germany during the last 10 years. So this may be a problem, this may be a sort of moment to rethink things. Alan Posner, doing that and bearing in mind that these discussions <clears throat> are perhaps two separate issues but, but linked issues, do you think that there needs to be greater control on right-wing parties or do we need them as a way to, as a sort of a, a control mechanism for individuals who could otherwise um, f become even more marginal? Oh, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big question. Um, I, I don't really think uh, that we need right-wing parties. I think Germany, for instance, I mean, what do you mean by right-wing parties? We have conservative parties in, in, in Germany, like the CDU and the CSU, and um, uh, I think they're doing quite a good job of, of keeping hold of the, uh, of the right-wing sector of, 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 of society. Do you really need a party, shall we say, to the, to the right of our conservative parties? Do you need a right to the party to the right? Of, I mean, do you need the British National Party? They're horrible people. Um, We're likely to see the Front National in France next year um, gets very significant yeah. returns. Does yeah, France yeah. need that party? Well, um, you'll have to ask the French that, and they'll answer it in, in the elections. But um, from outside, I don't see that they're really helping political discussion. If you have a real political discussion of the real issues, and immigration is only one of these issues, I mean, European integration, globalization, control of the financial markets, that much more important, actually. But if you have a real discussion of real issues in the existing parties, then you don't need these parties. These parties are an indicator of the fact that the discussion hasn't been open enough. And there is another thing, this, this was really not uh, the result of a party or, or even a group. It was one lunatic's work and uh, you can control as much as you like, you know, in the internet and, and, uh, <clears throat> and the people themselves, what they are uh, doing, how they are acting, you, you wouldn't have found anything before his stroke, probably. Jens, as far as that, at the outset when you were telling us the reaction that, that people have now a week uh, or nearly a week after, yeah. I was very much reminded of the reactions in my country after the 11th of September. The 11th of September changed the United States mm. in fundamental ways and in ways that have been ongoing. What do you think about Norway? Have these attacks permanently changed your country? Yeah, well, it's, there are going to be changes, of course. But uh, as you yourself point out, we, we have also seen what, how, uh, how wrong all, everything can go uh, after 9-11. Uh, <clears throat> I think lots of people understood immediately that uh, if we don't watch ourselves now, we are also going to end up with this uh, cowboy rhetorics and uh, uh, declare war on half the rest of the world and on, on groups of people who think or say things that we don't like. Uh, we, we, we try to avoid exactly that. Uh, this this wasn't, uh, as I said, a group. Uh, it was one, one uh, lunatic who who went uh, berserk. And it's um, the question is also how uh, how much influence he is going to uh, to um, be allowed to have on us or lives after this. 
Peter Costins, I would say that in the case of the U.S., the 11th of September attacks ushered in an era of fear that hasn't really ended. Um, do modern societies have to live with fear in that way? Uh, they have to cope with it and, and they have to take appropriate measures um, to downgrade the degree of fear. I mean, and one of the, the appropriate measures is uh, to enforce uh, the police forces to react as fast as possible. And um, this is, this is the, the rational in the irrational uh, of the event that you have to look at after a time of grief and anger. How can you react fast and efficient to this kind of movement and people? And still retain a healthy sense of naivete. Yeah. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.